Welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Julius Smetona. What is faith? What is the Catholic understanding of faith? We hear much about faith today, especially from the fundamentalistic communion. But now, to discuss the Catholic view of faith, we have with us the Reverend Donald Sanborn. Father Sanborn, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Father Sanborn, what is the Catholic notion of faith? It is a supernatural virtue given to us by God by which we give intellectual assent to truths revealed by God based on the authority of God revealing. So in other words, faith is not something one can do independently of God. One cannot have faith independently of God's assistance. Right. It comes from God and it is assent to truths based on his revealing authority. Uh, we make acts of natural faith every day. Uh, you, uh, when you see someone uh, with his blinker on, you assume that he's going to turn that way. You, you make a little act of faith that he's going to do that. Uh, you um, read uh, things in newspapers that you do not actually see with your own eyes. But you believe that it's true because you assume that they're telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, that is an act of faith where you yourself do not see it, but you take someone else's word for it. Mm -hmm. And so based on the authority of the newspaper or the journalist, you believe what is said. When God reveals something, we have not a natural faith, but a supernatural faith because we have the Word of God concerning it and also the, what, uh, the object of our faith, which is what we believe, are supernatural truths. Truths which exceed the power of our minds to grasp. Mm -hmm. So that's why we say it's a supernatural virtue. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the uh, Protestant notion of faith? How does this differ, differ from the Catholic notion? The Protestant notion of faith is trust in God, confidence in Christ uh, that He has saved you by His blood. Uh, and it is not an intellectual assent to truths. There is no uh, obligation in the Protestant church to believe this or that truth. Uh, in a Protestant church, you could be sitting next to uh, anyone who may or may not believe even the tenets that are in the Book of Common Prayer or what is explained by the preacher that are the, the norms of belief. Uh, even on things concerning divorce. Uh, I have spoken to uh, Protestants where they tell me that divorce is officially disapproved of, yet there are members who are divorced and remarried. Uh, there is no uh, doctrinal uniformity in the Protestant religion. What you must have to be a good Protestant is this trust in God and, and manifest it in your worship. Uh, so that is very different from the Catholic faith, which is assent, intellectual assent to truths. Mm -hmm. um, and that is why the, in order to be a Catholic, you must adhere to all of the truths of the Catholic faith, failing which you cease to be a Catholic. Mm -hmm. What are the properties uh, of Catholic faith? How does one recognize the Catholic uh, the faith, this is thing of faith? The faith, uh, just like anything else, has certain essential qualities. For example, if you wanted to distinguish true gold from fake gold, you would subject the article to certain tests. You would check its density, its weight, its conductivity of electricity. And should those readings not come up according to the properties of gold, you would say this is not true gold, no matter how much it looked like gold. Mm -hmm. The same is true of the faith, that it has certain qualities that betray the fact that it is the true faith. Mm -hmm. One of these is certitude, that we are 
absolutely certain of what is revealed by God. Uh, for example, Catholics bow down and adore our blessed Lord in the Holy Eucharist based on the fact that he said that he was there, that, that he is there in the Holy Eucharist. At the Last Supper, he took bread and said, this is my body. At, he also took wine and said, this is the chalice of my blood. And then he said to the apostles, do this in commemoration of me, giving them the power to do what he did. And so when the priest who has received ordination ultimately from the apostles, when he does what our Lord did at the holy sacrifice of the Mass, he then brings down upon the altar the presence of God in the Holy Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Catholics are more certain of that presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist than they are certain of their own existence. Now this, this seems rather striking to me. How can you be more certain of the Eucharistic presence of Christ than of your own existence? I mean, your own existence is a self-evident thing. To be certain of, of the existence of the Eucharist, you have to hear someone tell you that, so on and so forth. You could have misunderstood or whatever. It seems that the, you would certainly have a higher level of, of, of assurance that you exist as opposed to believing in the real presence. No, because the Word of God can never make a mistake. Whereas you are able to make a mistake by your reason. We often do. Every day we, we think things that are erroneous, perhaps little things. But we can err with our reason, but we cannot err in believing God. But that's the, the whole point. And in, in, in the French philosopher Descartes said, by doubting that you exist, you have proved that you exist. Because doubt is already a mode of thought. Well, I'm not saying that it is not certain that we exist. I'm saying that you are more certain of the presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist mm -hmm. because the, the first pertains simply to natural knowledge, the second pertains to supernatural knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then you begin to understand just how certain we are of the things that are revealed to us by God. So there's levels of certainty. That's Oh, yes. Saying. Oh, absolutely. There are levels of certitude. Uh, and... Uh, Another property of the faith is the exclusion of error. And this comes from common sense. If God has revealed something, then it, it automatically follows that whatever contradicts what he has revealed is wrong. It cannot be any other way. You cannot say that both are true. And so the Catholic Church unabashedly says to the whole world that it is the one true religion, one true church founded by our Lord Jesus Christ who is God. And because it is founded by Christ who is God, that all other religions are false. And so the Protestant religion is false, the Jewish religion is false, the Hindu religion is false, the Buddhist religion is false, because they contradict the Catholic religion. They are not the religion of God. And that is a property of it. And so when people like John Paul or, or people in his, his employ uh, go around to Jewish synagogues and partake in Jewish services or partake in the worship of snakes as he did in Africa. John or, Paul II? Yes, second. yes, yes. It was, uh, it was in the newspapers that he uh, partook in snake worship when he was on one of his African trips and that he uh, uh, offered some kind of little offering to the, to the snake god as part of an ecumenical gesture. Uh, when he went to the Lutheran church, he partook in Lutheran liturgy uh, and so forth, uh, Buddhist, uh, whatever, uh, all, all kinds of, even when he went to the islands, he partakes in their rites. Uh, the Indians here in this country, he was blessed by some sort of Indian minister or something. Medicine man. Yes. Um, 
uh, when he had the uh, when he permitted the Buddha to be placed on, on the altar in Assisi. When he does things like that, and when people like him do things like that, they betray the fact that they don't have the true faith, because they don't have this sense of the faith's exclusivity of what is against it. Mm -hmm. They don't see those things as contradicting the faith, mm -hmm. when in, in fact it's plain that they do. That they have a, a, a sense of all of it being true in, in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And that's a sign that the supernatural virtue of faith is not there. Mm -hmm. You know, in this country in particular, and in the West in general, uh, there seems to be the idea that one may be a good Catholic and disagree with the Pope or disagree with the Church's teachings. For instance, it's not at all unusual to hear one say, well, I believe abortion is all right, but I'm a Catholic. How does this tie in with your definition of faith? What if someone disagrees with the Pope when the Pope is teaching as Vicar of Christ in an official manner? What if one disagrees with an official teaching of the Church, which is binding in conscience, which has been defined by an ecumenical council or has is, is, is been taught ex cathedra? What, what happens? When you disagree with the teaching of the Catholic Church, first you commit the sin of infidelity which is lack of faith. You lose the faith inside. If you uh, manifest this, uh, you become uh, a heretic. You become uh, someone who externally dissents from the teaching of the Catholic Church. You break from the unity of faith of the Catholic Church. And consequently, you break from the Catholic Church. It is impossible to be a member of the Catholic Church, which is a congregation of the faithful. That's its basic idea, a congregation of the faithful. You, you break unity with that if you are not faithful, mm -hmm. meaning if, if you do not profess what the, the faith professes. So automatically you're, you're no longer a Catholic. Uh, and the Church has always taught this. The Church has always acted in this way. Canon law provides for that. If you defect from the Catholic faith, uh, you, are, you are no longer a member of the Catholic Church. You are automatically excommunicated from it if you should cease to profess the Catholic faith. So someone who says, I believe all these things which are condemned or I don't believe all these things which are taught and says, I am still a Catholic, he, he is kidding himself. Because this, this is something we are faced with every day. And again, in the, the political arena, we have a Governor Cuomo of New York or a Senator Kennedy from Massachusetts or a Geraldine Ferraro from New York as well, who often will say, well, privately they believe in a certain way, publicly they act in a certain way, or they might have exception to certain teachings of the church. Or even in the Time magazine, when John Paul II visited the United States in 1986, it. Uh, documented the fact that the Pope is coming to visit his feisty flock and that many uh, Americans don't like the idea of authority and being told to what they should believe. What you're saying is that if they think that they can do this and still be Catholics, they're gravely mistaken. Yes, they automatically cease to be Catholics once they adhere to anything that is officially condemned or cease to believe anything that is taught. Is there any reason why the hierarchy is, is not making this public or not coming down on these people for having these kind of attitudes? Because they themselves don't believe in the truths of the Catholic faith. Uh, I know of a man uh, out in Montana who uh, was at a, uh, a new liturgy uh, a mass and um, he uh, they were having communion in the hand and he saw one of these hosts on the floor. Someone had dropped uh, what was presumed to be a consecrated host on the floor. And he was horrified and went to the um, priest and uh, after the Mass and said, there's a host out on the floor and you, know, you should do something about it. And the priest seemed very nonchalant about the whole thing. So then, uh, this happened to be the cathedral church. So he went directly over to the bishop's house and eventually got to see the bishop after some waiting. 
And he explained to him that there was this host on the floor. And the bishop said, you know, we no longer believe in transubstantiation. You couldn't have a more explicit denial of the truths of the Catholic faith than that. We no longer believe in transubstantiation. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a bishop in Michigan who says uh, that there is no hell, uh, no purgatory uh, in the traditional Catholic sense. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, you have this document on AIDS which uh, says that uh, you can um, do something which is intrinsically evil uh, in order to avoid death. This is a denial of the church's moral teaching. Uh, well, these from what you said earlier, this, this, would, <laughs> this would be heresy. And these people, if they're doing it in a public manner, explicitly could not be considered Catholic. Yes. And what is worse, they have abandoned all notion of orthodoxy. Any idea of conformity, of conforming to a set rule of faith. That there's not even a notion of that. No one cares. It's just like the Protestant Church. As long as you're on the registers uh, of the church, as long as you give, uh, as, as long as you're on their mailing lists, you're considered a, a, a Catholic. Uh, it doesn't matter what you believe. Yes, there might be a certain norm that is uh, maintained, uh, you know, a certain uh, um, a line of, of thought or of teaching, the way John Paul occasionally reminds us. Uh, but there is no, there, there's no teeth in it. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's nothing to make you conform as there, were, as there was years ago. Um, if you did not uh, uh, uphold the Catholic faith, if you did not teach the Catholic faith years ago, you were excommunicated. There was a, uh, a um, priest who was in charge of, the, um, of a seminary on the East Coast, of, oh, about the turn of the century, who uh, permitted an exchange of professors with the Protestant seminary. When Rome, under St. Pius X, found out about it, they sent a cable firing him from his job. And the next day, they appointed the uh, chaplain of the fire department to be the head of the seminary. <laughs> and this was all bypassing the, the bishop of the diocese. Uh, as soon as they knew that somebody was acting in a way not in conformity with the Catholic faith, just manifesting some softness with regard to the teachings of the Catholic Church, that's it, you're out. Well, that seems to happen all the time today, that there's exchange of professors from other religions. This would be the norm almost. Yes, because there's no sense of orthodoxy. The, the, there was a, a poll which was conducted and it appeared, I think, in uh, the, the religious news service. And if my memory does not fail me, I believe that 50% or even greater percentage of Catholic priests said they doubt at some certain times transubstantiation. Does this number figure seem high to you? And if it's true, what are the implications? Uh, it doesn't seem high at all uh, when you see the way the what is supposedly the Holy Eucharist, is treated at the new Mass. Uh, it, it is obvious that they don't believe that it is the true presence of Christ. They, they couldn't. If you believed that that is the true presence of Christ, you would muster every ounce of reverence in you with regard to it. You, you would fear to touch it, mm -hmm. as priests always did. They had a, 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 such a reverence that they always felt unworthy to even go near it. Uh, and and uh, now it's just uh, like a loaf of bread. What about faith in the Old Testament vis-a-vis uh, -vis the chosen people? How did, uh, how did they treat the deposit they received directly from the prophets yeah. through God, from God? They uh, received uh, their faith some, in some cases directly from God. Uh, as Moses, Abraham. Uh, in other cases, uh, from the law, which was written by Moses, or from the prophets who spoke for God. Uh, 
um, this uh, the their faith was uh, a testimony of the firmness that we must have in our faith, uh, which is one of the other characteristics of the well, faith. You know, it's, I can recall in the, during the wanderings in the desert, uh, the people had no water. And Moses was commanded by God to strike the rock, and when he struck this rock, water would flow forth, so God told him. Well, as we all know, Moses struck the rock, and in his impatience, he struck it a second time, and then water flowed. And as a result, this very small, momentary disbelief by Moses resulted in the punishment that he was forbidden to enter into the promised land. Mm -hmm. How is this, uh, is this in general, how, what kind of a, uh, how should I say, a dedication or a, a faithfulness that, that God always demands from his people? Is this typical? Uh, yes, uh, God often uh, runs individual souls and peoples through a test of faith. Uh, it's amazing that the Jews wandering in the desert could have lost the faith when they had just seen a miracle upon miracle in Egypt. The ten plagues, the, the water turning to blood, the, the locusts, uh, the, the frogs, all of the, the plagues sent upon Egypt, the striking of the firstborn, their own protection by the blood of the Lamb, uh, the pillar of fire, the opening of the Red Sea, the destruction of the Egyptians. They had just been through a, 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 a spectacle of miracles from God, which confirms the faith. When you see a miracle, your, your faith is confirmed. Then they wander in the desert, and because God withdrew those signs, uh, and because they were then expected to uh, live on light food, which was the manna, and go through a certain penance and purification, many of them began to murmur and actually lose the faith in God. And they said, is the Lord still with us? And the, God wanted to destroy them for that. In fact, they even they built the golden calf and began to worship it. Yes, uh, even after Moses had struck the, the rock and received the water. Then, at the foot of the mountain, uh, they thought that Moses was dead, Mount Sinai, and having lost the faith again, even after having seen the manna and the water, having lost the faith again, they constructed the golden calf, Aaron with them, and worshipped it, and had the idea of returning to Egypt with this idol at their head in the hopes that the Egyptians would receive them back. And it says in Exodus that Moses descended from the mountain, saw the golden calf, threw the plates, the stone plates at the calf, and then at the command of God, it says very clearly, ordered that all those who had taken part in this and who were partisan to the worship of the golden calf be slain. 23,000 in number in one day, uh, which is, uh, again, and this is at the order of God mm -hmm. that this was done. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see that, of the, uh, that, that God was gradually purifying the faith of these people. Mm -hmm. So he even purified the faith of Moses, for he did not permit him to enter the promised land because of the hesitation of his faith. Well, you know, Father, it's, it's no secret that the view you hold of, of the current situation in the church is, to say the least, a minority point of view. But what you're basically saying is, is, just as in the Old Testament there was a falling away, you're saying that we're living in such times today. Mm -hmm. Because those who would disagree with you, you would say, do not have the faith. And this is the overwhelming majority of the faithful and the hierarchy. Uh, how do you, th this seems to be almost impossible, what you're saying. Well, if you're looking at numbers, we have the numbers on our side. 
because we are of the same faith as all the Catholics from the year 33 AD. So that's a lot more than all of the, no matter how many hundreds of millions you want to say are around today, who are espousing Protestantism or, or some form of, of Protestantism, something contradictory to the Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. So we win the numbers game. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it's not a numbers game. Even if there was one person left on the face of the earth that adhered to the Catholic faith, then he would be the only Catholic left. Mm -hmm. St. Athanasius says, said that if the whole world should become Arian, then it will be Athanasius against the world. Mm -hmm. And this must be our attitude today. What is the Catholic faith that has been handed down to us? And if the whole world should deny it, then it will, it will be us against the whole world, hmm. for that is what is given to us. It's a very interesting view, Father. Uh, we have run out of time.